We shall continue now in the fourth chapter of Luke this evening. And um, I need to pray now, and um, particularly prayer for the blessing of the Lord to be upon his work, and also to know personally his blessing for this task tonight. Most gracious Lord, we lift our hearts to you in thanksgiving and praise for your goodness and mercy and grace unto us this day. Lord, we lift our heart to you for all our need in this meeting tonight. You know our hearts. You know our need. And you know how we feel about our need. And we thank you that we can cast ourselves upon you because you care for us. And so we ask your blessing for the glory of your name through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If I might make some preface this night before speaking, um, I thank the Lord for his grace, the means of grace. Um, on the prayer book tonight, I know I found myself going through the prayers as if I was in a particular place where I was a uh, resident as a, someone returning from the army um, under conviction of sin um, and the Lord, as it were, leading me from there to, to hear the word. And I just found myself this night going over those words that I would have known off by heart and thinking, how much of a means of grace is that? And then I did go on a trip, my second trip to Romania to deliver a Land Rover. And of course, all the documents had to be um, verified, translated into Romanian. And um, a dear man that I met right down in the basement of the judiciary in uh, Borasov, an advocate, a solicitor, uh, to translate the documents. And um, I began to quit because he said to me, oh, you are from Wales. And I said to him, oh, yes, you know that, because it's written, I was born in Swansea, in the passport. Oh, no, he said, your name is Llewellyn, and you come from Wales. Llewellyn was the prince of Wales, and you know, my, my heart was beginning to tremble. Was he still of the Securitate? And um, a Securitate still carrying on, as he's carried on before? Anyway, I found out that he was a Christian. He was of German origin, and um, he became a Christian as a very young man. And what kept him going through all that time was this. He and one or two other people, this is far, far beyond before, this was during the days of the war, they could listen to a service that would have been broadcast, I take it weekdays, Sunday morning, of uh, out of the Book of Common Prayer, a kind of morning service, you know, even then having a, a good slot for 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour then in those days, which you would dare not have today. And uh, he'd said to me it was that which kept him going. And that was the only thing that he had wherever he was. Um, because he was German speaking, he might have been sort of drafted out from where he was in Romania um, into Austria, or whatever it was, and that was the thing that kept him, by the grace of God, in the early days of being a Christian, and brought him through. And I just wanted to share that tonight, because, you know, and the other thought I had is this, forgive me going on for just a moment, you see, there be very few people today who even would be praying what we have prayed for the sovereign of this land. Very few people who would be praying in the sense 
of praying through in order that the Lord might answer our prayers to bring upon him the grace of God. And we can say it, not in judgment, the grace of God that he desperately needs at this time. And the Lord is able to use even our prayers as the means of grace to be on him. And so perhaps I'd better just finish there on that line now and come to our text. <clears throat> and as we come to our text tonight, in continuing on, we come to the beginning of chapter 4. <clears throat> Jesus, being led, full of the Holy Ghost, being turned, returned, from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were handed, he hungered afterward. And the devil said to him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone in Luke. It's a particular stone, one stone. It's in the singular, if thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And you see, the devil came to tempt him. At this particular time, it was what he needed. He was hungry. Um... I've heard or read of someone who tried to express how it is that in the very depth of hunger, the, the, the hunger of, th of water to quench thirst and of food to eat is really intense indeed. And you see, that's the way, incidentally, that the devil comes to test us when we're in the depth of our need, whatever it is, in the depth of our need, he comes to test on every point that he's able to test. And this is where he started this temptation of Jesus. And we know that it didn't Stop here. He went away for a season, and that can legitimately be translated for he was waiting for a convenient season, a season that was convenient unto him so that he might make the most of it, if I can put it like that, or, or in that time, I could do it like this, seek to do to us as he did to the Lord Jesus, to inflict as much damage as is possible. And beloved, as we realize this tonight, there's, there's this to come by application to us tonight in the very beginning of our meeting. Haven't heard yet what's coming. That we might be built up and fortified and strengthened by the word that is within us. The word that the Holy Spirit brings to us, to, to, to our remembrance, that we also might stand in the day of temptation and testing, because the Lord makes intercession for us. And the other comforter, The other in the sense of heteros, not of a different kind, but of the same kind as he was to his disciples. That is the comforter who's left to us. One who is as, 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 as he was to, to his disciples. And after he was risen, the Holy Spirit coming as the advocate on earth, the one sent alongside to help, the one 
who is of the same kind, bringing indeed the very same comfort, so that as we are comforted and encouraged by him, that we might also comfort and encourage others. As we find that a comfort to ourselves, with the same comfort and encouragement, we might encourage others. And oh, beloved, it's a, a blessedness to know tonight that we indeed can be comforted of God. We felt his presence here. And his presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, is our comfort tonight, just as it was in his day of temptation in the wilderness. And he said, if thou be the Son of God, command this stone, it be made bread. When you read what others have written, they say, oh, there was a looking around. And all the stones that were around were shaped and fashioned in such a way that they looked like um, loaves of bread. Those who visited the Holy Land, and especially those writers of far off bygone days, that's the way they looked at it. And then, beloved, I began to think he's addressing Satan, in answer to this, I wonder if it was the fact that was put as a thought, or at least, you know, there was a time, remember we were talking about the, the, the power of the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist, and, and the power, not just of what John the Baptist was, was doing as one of the, great, the, the greatest of the prophets, preparing people to Come, remember he said that if you were bringing forth, uh, uh, come to bring forth, uh, um, come to bring forth fruits that are worthy of repentance. And he said that uh, that if those who were the, the the serpents and the vipers, that if they were not going to praise God, that they would be raised up out of these stones. Praise unto God. And in order for the stones to put forth praise, there would have needed to be a creation. A creation. In another place it speaks about of babes and sucklings. And you see, he was speaking fact that it was absolutely possible, not just metaphorical, possible for praise to be made unto God. And he who has no origin of himself or within himself to, to even think anything, he can only copy. I may not be right on this, we must attest with the word. But you see, there was a fact of some miraculous work to come. And when John the Baptist spoke, spoke those words, he spoke those words in the fullness and blessing of power of the Holy Spirit. the living word of the living God and the power and by the power of the living God. And here was the Lord Jesus in this great depth, perhaps a depth of hunger that was so deep that no, no one would have, as it were, been able to plumb 
that depth. If that is not true, it was out of the very depths that he hungered. And it was because of that that the devil said, command the stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, it is written. <coughs> Do you know, when Jesus says, it is written, he was saying it in the very way in the future days that Pontius Pilate had said that. You see, there'd been the backing and fawing of Jesus from this court of jurisdiction to that court of jurisdiction. That's the reason why there were three plaques made to go upon the cross. There's no sort of contradiction that there were three plaques made. There were three plaques made with writing on it. They were in different orders because that was, was written on every plaque. And when, it, when this plaque had been written by Pilate at the end, they said, oh, they wanted him to take it down, to alter it. Don't say that. Say that he said that. And what he said, what stands written is written. And he had all his authority behind it. What stands written is written. It's unalterable because I say so. That was, that was Pilate's attitude in taking this word and expressing it in that way. He was standing on the full authority or that he had representing Caesar. And when Jesus said to him, it is written, he was standing on the full authority that he had as the Son of God. And the very fact that he spoke like that was the definite proof that he was the Son of God. That is his stand. It is written. And we can't tell how loud and how what it meant for that to come to Satan. I might have some exuberance in shouting it tonight, but oh, beloved, 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 it came with all the authority from heaven. That was his. And his by right. And he spoke That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. When we read it there, it speaks of every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He didn't have to put those words in because it was true. When the word said, light, and light became, it came with full authority, brought light to being out of nothing. Beloved, that is the power by which the Lord Jesus dealt with Satan on all the points here <coughs> and on every point that was spoken against the evil one, the diabolos, the one who cast the word across it wasn't so much a casting of a word across. It was a word of direct 
confrontation as it were face to face. Beloved, that, that, that is the power and the authority with which the Lord Jesus addressed him. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And then the devil has got to change track, tack. And the mother track or tact, same thing, taketh him up into a high mountain and showed him in another place he speaks of in, in, in a moment of time. And people have read a lot into that, you know, as if all this was in the very mind of Jesus. Beloved, it could not have been in his mind at any time. His mind was perfect. As the word made flesh, his mind was perfect. The devil takes him. If the word of God says the devil takes him, the devil takes him. Not put thoughts in his mind to think this. And have him in his thought as it were. I'm, I'm speaking now as I would think about it. Thoughts that wander all over the place. No. The devil took him. We're not told by the mode of transport, if I could put it like that. But he was there. Took him up into a high mountain. And the devil wasn't saying anything that was lies. It was true. And showed him all the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, the diabolos said to him, the one who was casting words across to him, said to him, all this power, all this authority is the word, the dunamis. I'm sorry, the exousia. I will give thee and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me. He knew it had been delivered unto him. Not in that sense delivered on a plate and just put down in front of him. No, no, no. As the result of the fall of Eve in first place and Adam together with her. In the same place together. <coughs> It was delivered to him in that way. He gained it. The dominion that Adam had was completely handed over to him. The difference says that Adam didn't have to go up to a high mountain to show anybody. It was his. He had dominion over all. And when he came to tempt Adam, and there was the overcoming of that temptation by Adam, overcoming Adam, there was indeed that sin. And all this, and the devil is not speaking anything is untrue. For what is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And in this temptation, you see, he sought to bring it and give it to the Lord Jesus. And he is incidentally, what was, what was his aim in all of this? To bring about the divine purpose for which he had come. The divine purpose for which the word had been made flesh to dwell amongst us. And all this could only really, truly be taken out of the hand of Satan 
not by a voluntary giving up for it of it, but for going to the cross. That was the purpose to have all this by diverting him from the purpose for which he came. As he sought with the first Adam to divert him for the purpose of him being made and created. And then Eve being, you can't say created, being built together. piece by piece, so that she might, and this is the operative word, so that she might be in total correspondence to Adam. Correspondingly. And there was a purpose destined for Adam. And the devil wanted to make as much as he could out of that in order that what was his at this moment in his possession, he was willing to give it to Christ, to the Lord. If he would but but bow down and worship him. And the Lord said, and Adam, yes, the Lord said, it is written. It is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It is written. And beloved, we've got to remember here who it was addressing and for what benefit. In my naivety, I used to think this. He was quoting the word to him. The Lord Jesus was quoting the word to him so that Jesus would be reminded of it. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. No, 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 no. Do you know when the devil was created? He was created to do the will of God perfectly. The devil was reminding him that he was a created being. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Jesus wasn't speaking to himself, as we saw in the first one. He was speaking to him. And he was reminded he missed the first part, the most important part in the will of God, why he was created. This Satan, if you take it in the Hebrew form, this Diabolos reminded him too. And this means he was nothing but a creation, a creature. Not as man, but an angel. Many like him, all those who followed him. But instead of staying in his first state, he left it. And his purpose in the whole of temptation was this. Also to get uh, the Lord Jesus to move, as it were, from his first estate and the purpose for which he had come, which I've tried to present now in the first part of these three things. Get him off that purpose onto this. It is written, Thou shalt worship 
the Lord thy God, and him only on him only shalt thou serve. Bringing him to this place, and even being brought to this place the second time, he comes the third time. He brought him to Jerusalem set him high on a pinnacle of the temple. When you look at this, it's the, it's the sort of gable end. If you, if you look at the particular word um, that, that, that is there in, 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 in the construction here, to a, a gable end, and, and it, they, they say that at the gable end there was something that was a convenient sort of platform. Whether it's anything that's left in the architecture of the makeup to in the construction of the place that's purposely put in, whatever it was, it was this gable end, this high pinnacle. And he says to him, if, and if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself hence, for it is written. Look who's saying, for it is written. He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, and in their hands to bear thee up, lest thou at any time dash thy foot against the stone. He was quoting words that were truth, but he wasn't quoting the truth and all the truth. What was the purpose? He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Do you know, the devil either adds to the word of God or he takes away from the word of God. This is why we can tell his works in all the cults. Adding to the word of God or taking away from the word of God. Anyone who wants to be a Seventh-day Adventist, until you get to number 38 of their sort of... Um, before 40, you're introduced to the sort of Sabbath day and the Sabbath keeping. You go all through these things till 38, being led little by little by little by little by little off the track. And there's only then, two weeks later, about coming to the place where you are taught that you must keep the Sabbath and they are there alone and that they, they haven't changed no matter, no matter how much the trappings have changed and they've really come up. They're really coming up at the top in everything. You listen to the choirs, the Adventist choirs, like the Mormon choirs, beautiful in their singing. But beloved, the basics hasn't altered. The basics hasn't altered. The reason for the basics being not altered is this. The one who's laid the foundation of the basics in the first place. Laid. Securely or surely so that the basis might not change. That's the same with all the cults. Either adding in or adding out. And it's by their fruits he shall know them. And then we read, he says, an answering said unto him, said, do you know, do you know this one thing here? He doesn't quote, it is written. And answering said unto him, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. By the time he'd learnt the lesson of it is written twice. And then he thought that he would use the phrase for it is written. Jesus didn't have to say the third time it is written. Jesus 
said, oh, at least, do you know what I take it? Oh, the first time and the underlining it by the second time is sufficient. And he said, but it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is said. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. A kairos. A kairos. A season. A convenient time. And we know that when convenient times came, he came back. But beloved, oh, oh, oh. I don't know whether it is legitimate for me to say that by the time that Jesus got here that um, he was strengthened. As I might have thought of saying that, it's a blessed thing when you've got to check the thoughts, you know. See? Because he was absolutely triumphant from the beginning. And we must remember that it was as the perfect man he was absolutely um, in authority, in control, as perfect man. There was, if we just think of his divinity, oh, it, he could not be contented, con, con, he could not be tempted down that line. The devil was interested in getting him down this line. He couldn't go down the other line in any case. It was impossible for him to be tempted. It was impossible for him in that sense of his divinity to do anything that was absolutely wrong. It was possible for him to do it along the line of his perfect humanity. And it is that and that only and alone that he was tested on. Oh, beloved. Perhaps I should have stopped before I had said this last part. He departed from him for a season. Let's see if I can catch one phrase that I ought to underline. Yes, yes, yes. You see, from the very beginning, from the very first moment that Satan came to him, oh, he was absolutely, totally triumphant. And that's the thought I want to leave you with tonight. That the Holy Spirit would impress it upon our hearts and minds and spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's turn to Psalm 18. Sing the metrical psalm, Psalm 18, and we're singing from verse 28 to uh, 32. 28 to 32. The Lord will light my candle so that it shall shine full bright. The Lord, my God, will also make my darkness light. So we're singing verse 28. To thirty-two, Psalm eighteen, eighteen, Psalm eighteen, eighteen. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18.
page 31. <laughs> temptation, overcome the world and sin and hell and all for his people. He came into the world to save us from our sin. And we thank thee, Lord, that we too overcome as the saints before by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, what hope are we in ourselves to ever Amen. trust in anything that we might do or any strength that we might have to stand. But we thank you that we do stand because Christ is all in all, all perfect. His righteousness is counted to us. Oh, we thank you all for peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can say no to the devil and his temptations. Keep us, we pray, Lord. Keep us from vain thoughts of ourselves. Keep us in the knowledge and love of our precious Saviour. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Amen.